Now, that is a, a great hymn. I, I like that hymn. I remember it uh, as a child, and it's always got, every time we sing it, I remember um, being a child and, and hearing it. But it needs a little bit of correction, and it's a theology, okay? Because we're not marching to Zion. We are Zion. We are the people of God. We are the mountain of the Lord's house, and that's what I want to speak a little bit about this morning. I was speaking about it yesterday at the gathering. So could we turn to Isaiah chapter 2? Now, I know our reading was from the first and second Psalm this morning. We'll get there, the Lord permitting. Um, But I just want to share a few thoughts from Psalm 2, um, the mountain of the Lord. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And there's a whole message on that. But anyway, let's look at verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Well, every day that goes by, we're deeper in the last days. And again, we'll get a little bit theological when we say that the last days really are the Christian era, we would call it, or AD, Anno Domini, or since the first advent of our Lord. That's really all the last days. But of course, when we speak about the last days, we're really referring to the very last of days. Um, And we see God's purpose here. God has a purpose. And he has a blueprint. And um, we are supposed to be aware of that and we're supposed to function and build according to that. So what's it saying? It shall come to pass. And you know when the Bible says, when God's word says it shall come to pass, it shall come to pass. Regardless of how many people try to thwart it. So this is going to happen, brothers and sisters. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Now, mountains, uh, the metaphor uh, referred to in, uh, when it speaks about mountains, metaphorically, you would say, is about kingdoms, nations, powers. For example, the European Union is a mountain. Uh, France is a mountain, but there are other mountains. There, are, there, are, there is a mountain, because mountains is just another word really for nations or empires or powers or kingdoms. There's, there's a sense in which Facebook is a mountain. Uh, and so what he's saying it here is that there are mountains in the earth, there are powers in the earth, and of course Mount Babylon, or uh, Babylon is referred to as a mountain in Jeremiah chapter 52. 51, anyway, 51, I think. (laughs) I should remember. And of course, there's uh, Mount Edom. And the doom prophesied against Edom. So kingdoms are called mountains. And of course, uh, Israel, particularly Judah, uh, and in Jerusalem, there was Mount Zion. Mount Zion was a, a particular mountain within the city of Jerusalem, but it also became the name that a name that referred to the entire city of Jerusalem, and indeed the entire people, or or uh, of Judah, and indeed Israel. And in these last days, and we're in the last days, it just says here it shall come to pass. Zion is really a reference to the people of God, to the kingdom of God, to where God's people congregate and where God dwells, because the Bible tells us that God dwells in Zion and shines from Zion. We looked at a lot of that yesterday in the gathering. But it says it'll be established in the top of the mountains. Now, there, are, there is a lot of doom and gloom about the last days. And a lot of people believe that God's people will be, uh, you know, pretty much not just uh, at the bottom of the barrel, but under the barrel <laughs> and really be, in a, a sense, the punch bag of the devil. But that's not what my Bible tells me. The Bible says in the last days, and of course the last days means before Christ comes that second time, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, which means that the church will have yet greater sway and influence. It's interesting when you go and look at some of the 
prophecies um, that the covenanters had, and many of them had that prophetic gift and office. They spoke of the times we live in as being times where the church would arise again in greater glory and grandeur and majesty and once again be in the top of the mountains and in fact would destroy Babylon. And some of those covenanters even said it would happen from Scotland. Isn't that exciting to think that here in Scotland, God is purposing a mighty move that will pull down the gates of Babylon and cast Babylon down and, and it be fallen. And it says, shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. So we just sang, uh, we're marching to Zion, but really theologically, if you want to call it that, or doctrinally, it's the nations that are marching to us. Amen? Because we are God's Zion. And then it says, and many people, many people, many people, not some people, not a handful, oh, let, Lord, let's just get a, a, a few grains, you know, in, 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 in this harvest. No, folks, many people shall go and say, come ye, come ye, come ye that love the Lord. And let your joy be known. Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Let me paraphrase that for you, that they will say, come and let's go to church this morning. Let's go to that church in Tharsis Street. And let's hear the gospel preached. Let's hear the message. Let's hear the songs of Zion. Let's be in among the people of Zion. Let's go up to Mount Zion. And what does it say? It says, to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. This is a house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Out of Zion will come forth that which the nations need to hear and the wisdom that only God can provide that those nations out there need to hear, particularly at this desperate time when we see all around us the effects of man's folly and governmental wickedness and corruption. And look at these, this next verse. Uh, it says here, and he shall judge among the nations. The nations that come to Zion and the people that come, it says he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They're not coming to be told, Jesus loves you, this I know. And told, oh, Jesus doesn't mind your lifestyle. Oh, it doesn't really matter, you just come. That's all true. But we come to him reverently and with repentance. And that's why it says, he shall judge and shall rebuke many people. You don't come to church and roll up and stroll up, as they say, and do your own thing, man. Too many churches are like that. Amen? Oh, uh, God doesn't mind your lifestyle. He just wants you in church. And a lot of those folks, what, what they really mean is, we're not going to rebuke your lifestyle. We just want you to put your money in the offering bag and sit content. Well, in this place, brothers and sisters, that's not so. Because we teach God's word. And if it's a rebuke to you, let me just say this to you. If, if pastor is rebuking you from God or you feel that, let me tell you, pastor has been rebuked many times himself. Amen? And we all should have that heart. Because the Bible says, if you will not receive the chastisement of the Lord, then you are illegitimate. I'm not using King James language here. Uh, perhaps I should. But I'll use that term illegitimate. And none of us want to be illegitimate when it comes to the Lord. And they shall be, this is what I want to get to. When we look at the world today with war in Ukraine, with war in the Middle East, and it seems there's a bloodlust among our national leaders to get deeper into the fray, to send more weapons, to kill more people. But look what God's word tells us from Zion in the last days. That he will judge among the nations, he shall rebuke many people. And clearly Zion is God's instrument in bringing these things. 
It says, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's the message today for Rishi Sunak. That's the message today for President Biden. That's the message today for all belligerents in these wars. And let's, let's be really honest, we in the West, these are proxy wars for us. We are inciting and we are financing war and killing of innocent people. Uh, we're not doing anything that it says here. Look, we, peace, bringing peace. Do you know the Bible tells us that, that the peacemakers are the sons of God? So I want to ask you a question right now and change perhaps your thinking. If the peacemakers are the sons of God, what does that make the warmongers? Whose father are they? Whose father, are, you understand? Whose father do they have? Anyway. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. You see, it's clear from Scripture that the, the church, the ecclesia, the governmental assembly of God, God's kingdom, all the all the ways of describing Zion, Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord's house, the place where God's people dwell, the place where God dwells in and among his people, it's clear that from this place a law and the word goes forth and that law and that word is peace, not more war. Very apt as we come up to Remembrance Day, remembering the fallen. But also acknowledging, brothers and sisters, and I'm always very quick to point this out, that many wars that even our nation has built, and even when we have lost precious souls, and rightly remember these dear ones for the ultimate price they paid, some of the wars we've engaged in have been unjust and sometimes bordering on wicked. But this is not the way of Zion. The way of Zion Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. Sadly, in the West, we've learned war. We've learned that war accomplishes outcomes, and those outcomes are very often selfish and self-aggrandizing. Uh, and, you know, it, it, let me say this. If we can't see these things from the pulpit, then when are we going to say them? It's not my job to encourage governments, or any other pastor's job, or any preacher's job, or any man of God, or woman of God's job, it's not our job to create and encourage a culture where killing and war goes on. But it is our job to put a stop to it. I'm not preaching pacifism either, in case people say that. I, I, I do acknowledge that many of, in particular in Pentecostal circles, particularly in places like uh, the Elam Assemblies, uh, during the wars, they, they were very much, not, not everybody in Elam was a pacifist, but they did encourage pacifism. I'm not knocking that. I'm not also not encouraging it. I'm simply saying that when we uh, honestly examine God's word, we are not here, especially not here, to wage wars that are unjust. And that's not my message this morning, so I better get into it. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Turn back to Psalm 1 now. Um, to get where I really want to go. But, but this is part of it. Um, because look at what it says. And the reason why I, I read both Psalms together is because that is always, has always been the practice from ancient times. Um, going way back into uh, the, the, the times of Israel and Judah. It was always the practice to read Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 together. And scholars have noted that, that it's a little bit, of a, it seems odd to do that for the simple reason that both Psalms um, are completely different in terms of the, the, what the scope is. Okay, and in fact they were read so uh, together so often that actually some people, some scholars, posit the view that that they're really one Psalm. Okay, um, but it's odd because Psalm one blesses a man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. In other words, then it goes on to speak about he meditates the word. 
Psalm 1 is very clearly about personal devotion, about our individual personal walk with God. Um, and saying a blessed man is a man who meditates God's word. Now, I'm going to speak a little bit about that because it doesn't mean, oh, he reads his Bible every day. You ought to read your Bible. Uh, you ought to read it several times a day. But that's not what it's meaning here because the word meditate is actually a word that means, yes, to think and ponder, but it actually has a primarily vocal context. What it means is, that this man has God's word in his lips, that he's speaking it. You know, I know people that read the Bible every day and they're not even saved. But I, I guarantee you they don't read it out loud. They don't meditate. They don't take God's word and put it in their mouth and chew it like a cow chews the cud, which is what it really means. And I've shared this before when we speak about Bible meditation. Um, you know, the actual literal meaning of meditate is to coo like a dove under one's breath. And the, and, and, and it, but it can also mean to roar. It's a primarily vocal thing. But I would suggest that if you're going on the bus uh, tomorrow and you're going into town or whatever, that you don't sit and go, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because the driver will probably throw you off. So that's why you can speak it under your breath, though, can't you? That nobody can hear it. And the, the way that the, the, the ear is set up is that we have an inner ear and an outer ear. And the inner ear can pick up the very slightest whisper that you may, even if other people can. But your inner ear is designed to pick it up because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what's going on here then? He's saying, he, and, and, and so this was understood, but it's not understood, I'm talking about anciently, but it's not understood by our Western cultural thinking. Because we read Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, unlike, if you want to call it, the, the ancient Hebrews understood, the connection between the two. Because Psalm 2 is about the nations. Psalm 1 is about personal devotion. What's the connection? Well, I'll, I'll explain the connection. That's the purpose. Of, and we may go into a wee series about it because it's so vital to understand. How do we get from Isaiah chapter 2? How do we get this, sorry? How do we get to the place where we are now, where very much the nations, the mountains of this earth, are pressing down on the church and oppressing us, pressing down on God's people and oppressing us, where the kingdom of God seems weak and ineffectual? How do we get from this place where we are right now, dwindling congregations, churches closing, the influence of Christian men and women no longer what it once was, where they feared the church. We were once on top of the mountains. How did we get to the very bottom of the mountains and the mountains pressing on us? But more importantly, how do we get back there? This is the answer, brothers and sisters. Because, and we've not been taught this, but we need to be taught it. And I know people say, well, prayer is the answer. Well, I believe that. I believe prayer is a big, big part of it. We've all seen answers to prayers, not just in our personal lives, but even at that natural level. I can share with you, I've shared it before, that we, we engaged in very fervent prayer, as others did, about the situation here in Scotland. Bear in mind, at the start of the year, it looked like we weren't making progress. But some of us, pulled apart into real intense prayer. And within days, the breakthrough came, that wickedness that was amongst us. And it's still happening today. We've seen great answers to prayer uh, with Brexit. We saw great answers to prayer um, with the, the, the battle against the separatists in 2014, I think it was. We see great answers to prayer. And prayer is a vital part of it. But you know, it's actually even more fundamental than prayer. And this is why we need to see Psalm 1 and 2 and their connection. We see the blessed man. And we see that the blessed man doesn't sit in the way of sinners. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And, or stand in the way of sinners. Or sit in the seat of the scornful. In other words, the blessed man 
is a man who would rather meditate his word, the word of God, than engage in idle gossip and chatter and speak negatively about the nation. The blessed man is the man, and women of course, with God's word in his or her mouth. What, what's, what, what, what's the point of that? Well, let's read Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Why do the nations get into it? Why are the nations raging right now? Why are the nations in a rage right now over Ukraine, over Palestine, over the Israeli state, all these things? Why are they in a, why are they in a rage? Why is the clamor for war so strong? And it says, and the people imagine a vain thing or a futile thing, uh, or in other words, the people are, are inventing genders that don't exist. The people are inventing uh, all kinds of concepts and ideas. Why is the earth in such the condition that it's in right now? Why is the world a mess? Well, you know, we've all asked that question, but we, we, we don't need to tune in to the political commentary uh, on BBC Late Night and Question Time to get the answer, because the answer is in the next verse. The kings of the earth, we could say the presidents, the prime ministers, all of, all of these uh, governmental rulers set themselves. In other words, they take a strong position and the rulers take counsel together, or in some uh, versions, uh, interprets, they engage in a conspiracy. Oh, you're a conspiracist. No, I am a man who believes God's word. They conspire together against the Lord. Of course, the, the Hebrew here is Yahweh, which means God the Father. So the reason why the world's in a mess is because governmental leaders and rulers, kings, presidents, prime ministers, conspire together. What are they doing in those G8 meetings, G20 meetings? They're conspiring, folks. But what they're conspiring is against the word of God, against God himself. And look at this, and against his anointed. Now, we know that, that that's referring to the Messiah, to Christ. We know from various New Testament References to this psalm, what, what it's really saying here, what the psalmist is saying, and I want to point this out because uh, the first meaning here, the first meaning is when it's speaking here, and, and, and you can check this out scholarly, when it's saying against his anointed, David is actually referring to his own throne. He's actually saying that they conspire against the Lord and against the throne of David, but it has a messianic meaning. So we know that it also refers to Christ, who, of course, uh, is uh, to sit upon that throne, the ultimate occupant of that throne. So what he's really saying here is this, is that they're against God the Father and against his Son, the Anointed One, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. It's a conspiracy against God and against Christ and against the throne of David. Saying, and this is what, what, I'm, what we're going to make this link. I don't have a lot of time left, but I'll make this link for you here right now. And we will come back to this, I believe. It's so vital because we need to understand that this is the point of this message this morning. Your personal walk and life with God, your personal life with God impacts the nation whether that life is, is a, a, a lukewarm, compromised life or a strong, fervent walk with God. Either way, in any way, in every way, your life as a Christian, as a believer, as a follower of the Lord Jesus has an impact, as, as part of the people of Zion, impacts your nation. And when we understand that, it ought to make us far more intentional in our walk with the Lord. Yes, you say, well, I don't get to speak with presidents. I don't get to speak with prime ministers. I don't even go to my local Poon Council. Doesn't matter. What comes out of your mouth 
will change and shift atmospheres in your nation. And that's why the Bible says, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Cities and nations respond to what comes out of the mouth of the man or woman of God. And everyone here is a man or woman of God, if you know the Lord Jesus. Now watch this. This is what these rulers are saying. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What's that talking about? What? Who's they? Let us break their bands. Who's there? Who's they? Whose bands? And, and what, what, what do the bands comprise of? And cast away their cords from us. The rulers of the earth are meeting together and saying, we need to get out of this Christian paradigm where we have to obey God's word, where we have to be Christian in our government. We need to make our own laws and create our own genders and all our own ideologies because I, I don't know about you, President so-and-so, but I'm fed up listening to those Christian believers who tell us that Adam has to marry Eve and Adam is not allowed to marry Steve. And various other things. Why, why do we allow ourselves to be hemmed in by these believers? The nations for too long have been under the thrall of these, these Christian folks. That's what they're saying. Now I'm going to show you very quickly before we close. If you turn, this is the second Psalm. Let's turn to the second, last Psalm. But we'll, by the way, there's a lot of this in Scripture. But let's turn to Psalm 149. And we'll see this. The second, last Psalm. Look what it says. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Well, that's, that's here, isn't it? That's Zion. The Zion people of God are where the saints congregate. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and heart. Well, we've got a guitar. We do have a timbrel. Um, we don't have anyone dancing today. Uh, but I remember in the apostolic church we used to do a lot of dancing and some charismatic churches they do the dancing. Uh, some of the dancing is dubious, but there, there, is, a, there, is, a, there is a good dancing. Amen? <coughs> For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people, he will beautify them, make the salvation. This is where I want us to get to. Let the saints, are you a saint this morning or this afternoon? Be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Now, I want to just say this. What that means is where you live. In your bed. Even in your bed, you should be singing the songs of Zion. In other words, you don't have to go to a special meeting. You can do it in the house. You can do it driving in the car. You can do it as you go about your everyday life. I want you to see that being Zion isn't about always just coming to church. It's a wonderful thing. We do that. We get dressed. We come along. We enjoy our, each other's fellowship and we make a statement and a witness and a testimony. But you can do this in your bed, in your living room, in your couch. Look what it says. Watch this. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. The high praises of God means praise that destroys an enemy. And you can do this in your house when you go home. If you live in a detached house away from home, you can even roar. But I wouldn't do it if you're in a flat or live in a semi-detached. Look at what it says. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Some of you have a two-edged sword in your hand right now. And did you know that the two-edged in Hebrew and in Greek, when it says that, it means two-mouthed. And one is that God has spoken in his word but the second mouth is you taking his word and putting that word in your lips, in your mouth. You see, what comes out of your mouth impacts your nation. And then it says here, watch this. Why is the purpose of this? Why would we have a high praise of God in our mouth and a two-edged sword? In other words, you take the Bible and you speak it 
as a two-mouthed sword. Look what it says, the reason for that. Let me tell you, do you know that the devil probably knows the Bible better than you? And some people that aren't Christians and hate Christians, they know these things more than believers. We've not been taught this in church. Why? Let the high praise of God be the mouth of two in Why? To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Didn't it? We just read that God said, when the nations come, they'll be judged. When the people come, they'll be rebuked. It's the people of God, the Zion saints of God, that do that. that and how do you do it? You do it by speaking God's word. You do it by meditating the word, even in your house, even lying in your bed, even sitting uh, in your chair. What comes out of your mouth impacts the atmosphere, if you want to call it that, and impacts your nation. In other words, a speaking people, speaking the word of God, will transform a nation. That's why I think we talk a lot about reading the Bible. Oh, Bible read, we all need to read our Bible, folks. Speak it as you read it. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And as you speak God's word, what does it say? It brings vengeance. It brings punishments. Look at verse 8. This is what I'm trying to get to. And we need to close this very quickly. But it said, the kings of the earth say, Oh, let us cast us, let's cast away their cords. Oh, get those binds off us. Get those bounds off. Get them away from us. Here's what it says. When you meditate God's word and you praise him on your bit, not just in church, not just in a meeting, but even in your ordinary everyday life, your personal devotion, your walk with God, the blessed man sitting, not in the seat of the scornful, but sitting in his chair saying, I am now going to meditate God's word. Look at the effect of it. It says, it binds their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. As the believer, the saint of God, the Christian, uh, meditates God's word, it brings a binding and an imposition in the earth upon kings and nobles. And that's why they say, get these, get these bind, bind, bonds off us. And let me tell you, when you know that, you'll want to meditate more and more. It's not... Well, we have to have a big rally and get 10,000 Christians and we have to rent out Ibrox and get 50,000 people praying. No, no, folks. It just takes you. Solomon set up the nation in such a way that he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, if one man in Israel, one man cries out to you, or the whole of Israel, he brought it down to one man, then hear from heaven. And the Lord, what did the Lord answer him? If my people. And he said to Solomon, I accept that. It only takes one man. It only took John Knox. And he said, oh, there, there were others. Not many to begin with. Okay? It only takes one person. But I do believe that there's more and more to bind their kings with change. You can bind Rishi Sunak today. Why do we pray for our national leaders? I need to close this. Sorry, I went way over my time. So that God will turn their heart and, in effect, impose upon them his will and his purpose. That's the binding that they don't want. But that's the binding you and I can make happen as we pray and as we meditate and as we just allow God's word to speak through us to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have archbishops, pastors, reverence, no. All his saints, every saint, has this honor that by speaking God's word, by praising him, what does it say? Let Glasgow flourish. By the preaching of thy word and the praising of thy name, and we could now add to that, by the meditation of God's holy scripture. Anyway, I've run out of time. Praise you the Lord. Great way to finish the psalm. Great way to finish the message. The Lord bless you folks.